Thanks for joining us here in the security studies uh, session. Uh, I'd like to just uh, get started right away. We got some really, really interesting papers to uh, learn about today, and this is uh, Philip Holtinger uh, presenting about uh, Java exploitation. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you. Um, yeah, my name is Philip Holtzinger, and uh, I will present an in-depth study of more than 10 years of Java exploitation. Um, this is joint work with um, Stefan Triller from Fraunhofer SIT, Alexandre Bartel, who recently moved to the University of Luxembourg, and my professor, Eric Bodden, from Paderborn University and Fraunhofer IEM. So, um, Java has been around for like 20 years. It has been popularized in the mid-90s, and based on the numbers provided by Oracle here, I think it's safe to say that it's a story of success, um, by which I mean that um, it's one of the most widely deployed platforms of its kind today, right? Um, at the same time, however, we also know that Java is one of the top attack vectors for criminals, and it has been um, that case for quite some time. Um, so um, Cisco, in uh, Cisco in their annual report, for instance, uh, found in 2013 that it's actually 87% of web exploits um, that are based on Java. And in 2014, it was even worse. And it was, um, as they say, leading the pack. And um, Java keeps evolving um, on the one hand, but also new platform, platforms emerge um, like .NET and Android that, have, that share certain characteristics with Java. So we thought it's, it's really about time to look back at the history of Java exploitation um, and see if we can conclude things that helps us to improve the sec security of current systems and also future systems. So specifically, we sought to um, address the research questions presented here. Um, number one, what are the weaknesses attackers to exploit? Uh, uh, attackers exploit to implement their attacks, and number two, um, how do attackers combine the weaknesses to attack vectors? And for that, um, we applied a four-step process. Um, so first of all, we want to um, collect um, exploits um, with a broad sample set, and um, then we want to model exploit behavior in such a way that it actually allows us to draw meaningful conclusions. Uh, which we use to answer research question one, which is um, deriving commonly used weaknesses by those exploits, and in the next step, looking at how attackers actually combine those weaknesses to actually implement full attacks. Now, let's start with um, the first step. Collect a sample set of exploits. So, um, we um, did a web search um, to find original exploits from, from various online sources. Um, and we then removed all unnecessary code because um, to a large extent this is proof of concept implementations which means people in, in, um, include um, code like graphical um, user interfaces um, but also obviously payloads that we don't want in our testing sample set, right? Um, and also other code constructs that are just not necessary for or crucial to the actual attack. And then, interestingly, in very rare cases, it happened that we had to fix bugs because also exploits are implemented by people and people make mistakes. It's a rare case, but it does happen. Um, and we then tried to reproduce attacks because we wanted to make sure that when we are analyzing these exploits, we are actually just considering things that we know did work for at least one version of Java in the past. We threw away all those um, irreproducible exploits because we were just not sure as to whether they were actually complete um, or ever worked at all. Um, and also, since um, we um, retrieved um, various exploits from various um, online sources, um, there's a realistic chance that these are actually um, semantically identical exploits, right? So we wanted to merge them here, making sure that we end up with a, a set of unique exploits only. And finally, um, we integrated all those exploits into our custom exploit um, framework to make sure that we have less effort and little effort with implementing the exploits, but also with testing the exploits and rep reproducing the exploits. So in numbers, that means um, we collected a total of 87 original exploits um, coming from those uh, five um, online sources that you see here. Um, in our web search, we also found other sources, but those sources pointed to any of those sources um, or was just an identical copy of, of what we found there. Um, so this is the set that we used as the basis for our follow-up actions. Um, we 
had the 87 exploits as the basis, and 18 um, out of those 87 um, original exploits we were not ca um, able to reproduce. Um, we, we threw them away. Um, there were various reasons for why we could not reproduce them. Um, maybe if you spend like an infinite amount of additional effort, you get some of them to work actually, um, but some of them are just incomplete probably. Um, so the, the remaining 69 exploits are what we called minimal exploits, meaning it's just the crucial code that is required to actually perform the attack. And um, we reviewed these uh, 69 minimal exploits um, to make sure that those are actually unique exploits. And um, in that step, we found that eight of those exploits are actually duplicates of some of the other ones, which finally means we ended up with 61 unique exploits, minimal exploits in our sample set. And this is the set of samples, uh, this is the sample set that we used for the follow-up actions. So in the next step, um, from that sample set of exploits, we actually want to draw, con draw conclusions, right? But the immediate and first question is, how do we do that? It's, it's a whole lot of source code, and it's not trivial to review or look at it and then draw some conclusions that help us, helps us to actually understand why Java was insecure or is insecure. So um, to be more precise, um, Take this as an example. Um, these are uh, two code snippets taken from uh, two different exploits. The details of the implementation is not important now. What is important, um, however, is the, the obvious fact um, that those are different implementations. As you can see, they are syntactically different. However, um, they implement the same functionality, which means the, both code pieces actually serve the same purpose. Um, we can, in this example, uh, tell that from the first comment here. Um, it's in both cases that this code is used to load arbitrary classes. So what I'm trying to um, bring across here is by just looking at the source code, it's not trivial to, to find pieces of code that actually try to achieve the same thing, try to exploit the same weakness. Um, so what we actually need is some sort of abstract building block, something that tells us that this piece of code implements a certain functionality that is needed for implementing a certain attack. Implementation details are maybe not important in this case. So to be able to model all exploits in the sample set um, in that way, we came up with a new meta model that is specifically designed to allow us to actually model exploit behavior in, in, in a way that allows us to do, to, to do the, that sort of um, uh, comparisons. Um, so we started saying that um, exploits implement attack vectors and an attack vector um, achieves a final goal. A final goal could be um, what we called a full bypass, uh, which means that's arbitrary code execution or a denial of service or information disclosure. Um, those are the three only final goals that we found in the sample set. Um, and an attack vector, however, is combined of one or more what we call primitives. Um, a primitive is a building block of an attack, um, which means um, a full attack is comprised of potentially more than one um, building blocks. We f note um, that these building blocks are abstract descriptions, which means this is not executable code or anything. It's, it's rather some sort of textual description of, of what a certain piece of code would actually achieve as a sub goal. We further made a differentiation of um, two different kinds of building blocks. So on the one hand, we, we have what we call attacker primitives, which is building blocks that are based on um, what pretty much everyone else would call a vulnerability, because um, implementations of, of these primitives um, by themselves violate Java's security model. I will give examples um, on the next slide so it becomes clearer. Um, but um, on the other hand, we also have helper primitives. Um, those are building blocks or functionality um, that was introduced into the Java platform on purpose. It's a feature. It's there for everyone to use it. It's special, however, because um, they add value to at least one attacker primitive. So it means that um, a certain vulnerability becomes more effective or even effective in the first place at all just because of, of, of that helper. I will also give examples for that in a minute. And since these are just abstract um, descriptions of building blocks, in the end we also need um, concrete implementations. And by concrete implementation, I actually mean code. Um, 
So to provide an example, um, an attacker primitive um, could be um, load restricted classes. Um, so usually um, Java provides a feature which is called um, dynamic um, um, class loading, which means um, classes can load other classes at runtime. However, there's a set of what we call restricted classes, um, which untrusted code should be incapable of loading because those restricted classes contain sensitive functionality that can be used to break out of the sandbox. So um, vulnerabilities that allow an attacker untrusted code um, to load such restricted classes is by itself a vulnerability. That's why we call such behavior an attacker primitive. On the other hand, however, we have a helper primitive that somehow goes together with that attacker primitive, which is a set of restricted classes um, that allow um, the caller to define a class in a privileged context. Defining classes in a privileged context is highly desirable because um, that means that the class that we define here is associated with a protection domain that um, in, its, uh, in turn is associate, associated with all permissions. In other words, we achieve um, arbitrary code execution if we, if we actually um, define a class that way. It, it is a helper because the fact that th there are such restricted classes is not a vulnerability by itself. So those restricted classes have been introduced on purpose. However, in combination, if we use a vulnerability to load a restricted class that allows us to do that, that's a big issue, right? Um, another example of this would be um, a vulnerability um, that allows untrusted code to use a trusted system class to perform a call. That by itself violates the security model. But how is that even effective? Well, because of the helper primitive here, which is an example of a caller-sensitive method, that caller-sensitive method um, allows um, the loading of arbitrary classes if the immediate caller is privileged. Caller-sensitive methods mean, means that um, they behave differently depending on who the immediate caller is. Um, in that specific case, it means if the immediate caller is a trusted caller, loading of arbitrary classes, including restricted classes, is possible. Without such a vulnerability, um, attackers would have to call such a caller-sensitive method immediately. But because they are caller-sensitive, that call would be pointless, right? Because the immediate caller would be untrusted. Now, um, we went through the sample set iteratively and we came finally to a set of 27 attacker primitives and um, 10 helper primitives. Now, um, in the meta model, we saw that those primitives are combined to attack vectors, right? So, um, how do those attack vectors actually look like? Um, I have examples for this. Um, I chose this, this example because it's the shortest possible example. It's of length one. And as we can see, it, it just employs a single attacker primitive, or in other words, a single vulnerability to overwrite um, or read values of arbitrary non-static fields. So if we find a concrete vulnerability that allows us to achieve this, um, we can achieve arbitrary code execution. So this is a special vector because th there is no, com no further combinations needed, right? But there are also other attack vectors, as you can see here. Um, that, are actually, um, that actually require a number of different um, helpers and attackers. Um, so in that second example, um, the exploit would um, look up a method handle, number one, um, of a specific caller-sensitive method, which would be number three. Um, and that caller-sensitive method um, will not be called immediately, but through a vulnerability um, which means that we use a system class to perform the, perform the call on the caller-sensitive method number two, to finally load a restricted class, and this restricted class is then used to define a class in a privileged context. It sounds complex, and it's also not, not trivial. Um, I just want to illustrate there are also other kinds of attack vectors that need some sort of combination and puzzling. Now, what are common weaknesses attackers actually implement, uh, exploit to implement um, their attacks? So I could, oh, the, the research question, um, just to recall, is um, exactly what I just said. Um, I could provide you with a full list of all the exploits and a super complex graph um, that shows you how they interact, but that, that's not, not a good way to draw conclusions from that, right? So we, we somehow need to um, summarize some of the findings that we have, and f we, we clustered um, exploits, uh, we, sorry, we clustered primitives um, that, that are um, very similar um, to more abstract weaknesses. So um, a concrete example would be uh, 
um, we, we reviewed the list of all primitives that we identified and then we, we um, clustered those that, that really implement pretty much the same thing to something that um, is more abstract in this case. Um, we have various primitives that involve the loading of classes that somebody should not be, be capable of loading and we combine it to a weakness calling it loading of arbitrary classes. That makes it a bit easier to get an overview of what, what is actually typical of exploit um, implement, um, implementation. Um, the result of this is a set of nine weaknesses um, used by at least 10% of all exploits in the sample set. Um, in detail, that means, um, number one, uh, we find that um, more than half of all exploits um, make unauthorized use of restricted classes. Now, this is really interesting because there is something special about restricted classes. Um, Usually, um, Java and the security model of Java is based on stack-based access control, which means all sensitive functionality, like the loading of classes and um, network and file access, is actually um, protected and guarded by a call to the security manager, which will perform a stack walk and then make a decision as to whether the um, attempted call is actually valid or not. Restricted classes, in I think all, all cases, don't do that. They are protected in a capability-based manner, which means um, we try to prevent untrusted code to get an instance of a restricted class and hope that this works and that this holds. If, however, untrusted code finds a way to get an inst of instance of a restricted class, all functionality in that restricted class can be used um, without having to bypass um, a permission check. Now, that's really interesting and really a big problem. Um, Number two, um, we find that um, a bit more than half of all, class, uh, of all exploits uh, find vulnerabilities um, that allow them to load um, arbitrary classes. Now, it, it seems like this is 100% um, overlap with the first one. It's not, um, because you can actually achieve, um, you can retrieve instances of restricted classes without using class loading vulnerabilities. There are examples of this, for instance, um, Let's say in the most trivial example, you have a public method of a trusted class that will just return um, an instance of a restricted class, right? Um, this is not a class loading vulnerability per se, um, but it would be an alternative way of getting access to restricted classes. Um, however, we find that there's a, let's say, at least a large overlap. So typically when attackers use restricted classes, they also use um, a vulnerability in the class loading mechanism. Um, also very interesting is number four and number seven, um, reflection and method handles. So um, this is similar functionality and we find that it's heavily involved in exploit implementation. Um, by which we mean either it's exploits that use reflection or method handles to prepare the actual attack or it's actually um, exploits that depend on vulnerabilities which were introduced in the first place um, due to incorrect implementations of reflection or method handles. Um, both is possible and both happens, which is also an interesting finding. And um, the next question is, how do attackers actually combine those weaknesses to attack vectors, right? This is the second research question. And um, to answer this, um, let me show you a simplified and um, minimal um, attack tree. So in this attack tree, um, we see the three different attack vectors or kinds of attack vectors that we identified. You see them in the, in the second line. So um, the first category of attacks that we found is the single step attacks. Um, these single step attacks are special in the sense that they are like the first example vector that I showed you. They are just comprised of one single um, attacker primitive, meaning they exploit one single vulnerability and um, with that they achieve their final goal. So typically, um, that is um, information disclosure exploits, for instance, um, they are typically rather small. Um, they find a vulnerability to, to, to gather information about the host system and then they are done, nothing more happens. And that's also the case for um, denial of service exploits, for instance, um, because they also find one way to actually crash the machine or something, um, and then they are gone. And also trusted method chaining, there's a few trust, trusted method chaining exploits here. Um, which is also examples of, of exploits that are really, really short and exploit just a single vulnerability to achieve their goal. This is different for the second category of attacks that we found, um, the information hiding attacks. 
Um, so those are compound vectors, meaning they, they, com they, com they combine various um, um, vulnerabilities or, or help us to actually achieve, achieve their goal. And um, what, what they do is they, they um, try to break information hiding to get access to sensitive fields of system classes and then change their values. For instance, a, a typical field is system security because system security holds the instance of the, of the security manager, manager that is currently in place. So if you manage to override this single field with let's say a null value, um, you already achieved arbitrary code execution. Um, the third kind of attack vector is in the middle, the restricted class attack. Now, those restricted class attacks are also compound vectors, and what's special about them is they um, use at least one restricted class within the vector to achieve at least um, a sub-goal within the exploit. And the way they do that is also, in many cases, as it is shown here, so it's, it's a three-step process. In the first step, we need some, some uh, creative way of getting access to the restricted class in the first place. Um, and in most cases, these are actually two options. Um, the, the first option is um, we use a confused deputy in combination with a caller sensitive method. So I mentioned this already, there are caller sensitive methods. A good example is class for name. If an attacker finds a confused deputy, um, which means a system class, um, to perform the call to class for name, um, we can use class for name to load restricted classes because the immediate caller, the, restrict, the, the, the system class, is trusted. We can use this combination to load an arbitrary class, a restricted class. Another way of loading a restricted class would be to use um, a dedicated vulnerability. So there are vulnerabilities, um, interfaces, public interfaces, that immediate, immediately allow untrusted code to retrieve instances of restricted classes. That also happens. Now, that's the first sub-goal here. We have to get the instance of the restricted class. Once we have the, oh, I'm sorry. Once we have the instance of the restricted class, we also need a way to actually access its functionality. So I mentioned before, the functionality is not protected by a, um, by a stack walk, because bypassing the stack, would, st stack walk would be really tough. Um, however, um, we, we cannot um, just use reflection um, to use the methods within the system, uh, within the restricted class, because also um, reflection would perform dynamic checks, making sure that we are actually not doing it. So we also need some creative way of achieving this. And this is achieved the same way as loading the restricted class in the first place. We can use a combination of a confused deputy and a caller sensitive method to, to get such a, um, such a method um, within a restricted class or use a dedicated vulnerability for this. Um, caller sensitive methods um, involved in, in this step um, um, could be um, class get declared methods, for instance, which is frequently used. If we look at, that, uh, look at this in terms of numbers, um, we find, interestingly, that almost half of the exploits implement a single step um, vector, meaning half of those exploits find vul vul one vulnerability and immediately make, make use of it. And um, roughly the other half of exploits um, implements a restricted class attack in a way that I just explained. Um, information disclosure attacks do happen, but it's rare cases. Uh, we, we provide a, a bit of technical detail in the paper. So if you're interested, um, you can read that up. Um, but the actual issues are, are the, the two attack vectors, um, the, the, the two kinds of uh, categories here. Now, um, what we conclude from this is clearly the concept of restricted classes is really fragile, right? Um, maybe there are ways to do this differently. Maybe employing um, classical stack-based access control um, and be consistent in it instead of trying the capability-based uh, capability way of protecting restricted classes because we found that it's, it's it fails very often. Also, um, reflection and method handles conceptually violate the security model. It's a source of a lot of vulnerabilities trying to implement it in such a way that it's not actually an immediate security problem, right? Um, because information hiding is crucial to the security of the platform. I mentioned system security as one example of a private field um, that is really, really very um, highly sensitive to the security of the platform. And finally, um, caller sensitivity, so methods like class for name and class get declared fields and class get de declared methods, they significantly increase the attack surface. Without such caller sensitive uh, met methods, um, most or, or all confused deputies would be um, ineffective. Um, and if we address these issues, we clearly improve the security of this platform. And also, if we work on other platforms that are more or less similar, we should definitely 
think twice about whether we want such functionality and how we actually implement it. Now, to conclude, we originally um, obtained 87 exploits uh, from online sources and we transformed them into a set of 61 minimal unique exploits. And we came up with a meta model that allows us to document the behavior in those, um, of the exploits in that sample set such that we can make comparisons and draw conclusions. And the first result of this is a set of nine weaknesses that are commonly exploited um, by attackers. Um, including the unauthorized use of restricted classes and method handles and reflection, for instance. And finally, um, we concluded that there are three kinds of um, or categories of attack vectors, including single step attacks, restricted class attacks, and information hiding attacks, um, whereas the, the first two are the most common ones. Um, future research um, should focus on um, reconsidering how we actually want to implement sensitive functionality that is currently contained in restricted classes. Maybe stack-based access control is not the right thing. Maybe we need something entirely different. And also we may want to try to reduce the risks of um, uh, caller sensitivity and also reflective functionality. And I'm happy to answer your questions and thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, Phil. That's a great, uh, great talk. Uh, please come, come to the mic if you have any questions. State your name and your affiliation. Matthias Meyer, Purdue University. Uh, great talk. Uh, quick question. So most of the exploits will consist of multiple steps that have to be executed one after the other. So for those, uh, when you looked at the individual exploits, which of the steps were necessary or required? And for which of the steps would an attacker have found alternate paths to get a successful mm -hmm. exploit. Mm -hmm. Because if you have limited resources, this is likely where you would want to bundle the resources as a defender. Mm -hmm. Okay, so first of all, um, by minimal exploits, I'm, I'm actually really strict. Minimal means if you remove like any, any line of code or any, any, any actual call to a method, that, that entire exploit would work anymore. So, so that means um, no, you cannot um, remove any primitives from an attack vector and still have it work. But you might find alternatives for um, some of the individual steps in there. So um, by alternative, you mean um, using the same primitive but using a different implementation? Absolutely. Totally correct. And that, that's also what, what we found, right? So um, as, as, you can, as you saw, we have 61 minimal exploits but only 31 vectors. So that means there must be um, exploits that implement um, the same vector. And that happens. So by same vector, I mean um, the same set of primitives implemented, but at least one implementation of at least one of the primitives is different meaning um, either using a different vulnerability um, or using a different helper method. And yeah, also um, various recombinations of exploits and primitive implementations are possible. And so as a defender, where should I hedge my bets? What should I target first? So um, I think um, restricted classes really, really are a big issue. Um, so. One, one easy and first thing is um, to ev evaluate whether it's possible to identify um, critical functionality within restricted classes. For instance, I mentioned um, restricted classes that provide um, interfaces that allow you to define a, a custom class in a privileged context. So I don't understand why such a functionality should not be protected by a stack walk, right? Um, that's definitely one thing. Um, one other thing is caller sensitivity. So I, I find caller sensitivity is such a um, peculiar thing. It's, it, it's counterintuitive. Um, I also, I, I don't see why this, this, this cannot be invaded. I think there are perfectly fine alternatives um, that, that better match the object-oriented um, paradigm also, um, which is another thing I would clearly address. Um, so either trying to get rid of, of caller-sensitive functionality or find a creative way that, that, re that retains caller-sensitivity but doesn't pose a risk, but I don't know if that is possible. Thank you. Let's thank our speaker again. <laughs>